Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Book Clubs Across Borders session between um, Parwan and uh, Muzaffarabad. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Rahul Pindi, uh, Parwan and uh, Rahul Pindi, I apologize. Um, unfortunately, our friends in Rahul Pindi will not be able to join us because of COVID restrictions and um, the number of cases rising up in Pakistan and the US embassy's policy for in-person meetings for Pakistan. So we have some testimonies from our students in Rawalpindi, which we will be sharing with you as we progress further into the project. But for today's session, we would like to start the conversation by asking your students in Parwan to tell us about the book that they read and uh, if they would be willing to share a small summary of the book that they read so we can understand which part of the book really resonated with them and we can take a con conversation forward from there. So Parwan, over to you. Yeah, I'd like to uh, talk about some of the book. Hi, good morning. Uh, this book was about Iqbal Messi, who was um, uh, who his mother had been sold him uh, him because of the uh, family debt, and uh, his master name was. Yeah, his master name was uh, Hussein Khan, and uh, he just inspired all, all of the children who was there to uh, make a future, make a plan for the future, however they work. Uh, and that fact, this is all I got from this book. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. I hope everybody is doing well uh, and started a good morning. So uh, the, the, the thing about the book actually is that, you know, when, whenever I start a new book, um, sometimes, you know, a book I study remains my favorite for like months and then uh, it, it does not like when I read the next book, it becomes my favorite. But uh, when I read the book completely, it was like amazing. And uh, what I love about this book is that you have such a feeling that the, the writer gives you such a feeling that you feel yourself in the book, that you feel yourself inside the story. So uh, what I like, uh, what I and, and what I like about Iqbal Masih is that his his brave, uh, you know, he, he was brave and he was so committed and. Uh, that he, that he followed the truth and he, um, you know, he needed those kids to get out of those, uh, get out of the uh, hands of Hussain Khan. So uh, the next thing about the book is that uh, I started right, uh, I started the book right after Sinti of the first uh, day of Ramadan and I finished it just like in four hours. And then I had to sleep because I was so sleepy. And when I woke up back at nine, I thought I have seen a dream and the, yeah so uh, I, I thought that yeah it might be a dream uh, the book i just read it might be a dream and uh, it, it it had some emotional moments that maybe we will talk about later on uh, uh, at the end with, which isn't really a good end but uh, i still love his personality and uh, i love that he was coming to us this way Thank you so much for that. And I love the fact that um, you read the book and you went to sleep and um, you were still thinking over it and it was still mulling in your mind. That kind of shows the impact that books have in our lives and the kind of emotional attachment that we end up creating with these books. So that's fantastic. Anybody else from Parwan would like to come and say a little something about the book? In the name of Allah, good morning. Uh, I hope you have a good day. Um, the book was, uh, when I read it, it was amazing and uh, I really like it. And uh, the, the story was so uh, uh, attractive. And uh, the story was about uh, the ball, a group of children, uh, the children who are forced to engage, uh, engage in slave labor. 
And this uh, about the freedom of the, the story was about the freedom of the children. And that uh, was amazing for me. And um, yeah, that in the Pakistan. And uh, but the story was a uh, new children that their uh, ball came arise and said the children uh, do hard works to get the freedom uh, or stay in here to be a slave. That's how I got from the story. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Anybody else who'd like to come and say a little something about the book from Parvan? Um, it is good to uh, re-listen to Ms. Alia. All right. So um, actually, I have something very interesting. Uh, as I was trying to look up material that I could share with you people for the book, and uh, I wanted to keep the conversation running, and I wanted to kind of also share some things which inspired us while we were putting our, our um, you know, while we we're putting a curatorial dialogue together for you. And I came across this recital from the book. And it's a, it's a small passage, it's just 16 minutes, but it's literally the core of what the book is about, what the message of the book is about. And, and the person who is uh, reading this passage, um, their voice is really good. So um, I'm not really a big fan of audiobooks generally, but this really resonated with me. So I would like to share that with all of you first. Then I would like us to have a little conversation on the passage that we will just hear. And after that, Rumat can take us through the testimonies that have come in from, from Rawal Pindi. So I'm just going to be uh, sharing the passage with you all right now. And once uh, we have read the, uh, once we have read the, heard the passage, then we will take the conversation. Iqbal. 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 By Francesco de Amato, translated by Anne Leonore, based on the life of Iqbal Masi. Iqbal appeared one morning, just as summer was about to begin. The sun was high and warm, and its long beams of light caught the eddying dust in the workroom. Two beams crossed right in the middle of my carpet, accentuating the bright colors, and I imagined they were swords clashing in a mortal duel. One was the sword of the good hero, the other was of an evil villain. My hands, as they made knots, could give the hero's sword a slight advantage moving the other sword away for a brief second, but the implicable evil sword returned. One of the boys, Kareem, said he'd been to the cinema twice and that the movies told stories of good and evil. After great tribulation, the hero always triumphed. Then he put on a beautiful suit of colored silk and asked for the hand of his favorite maiden. The father couldn't refuse. No, he was happy because the hero had risked his life. Good had defeated evil. Kareem, who was almost 17 and whose fingers had grown too thick and awkward to make the thin, delicate knots of the carpets, had become a sort of overseer to us children. It was probably true that he'd been to the movies, even if such luck seemed incredible to us, because some evenings when he was in a good mood, Kareem told us the movie stories with all their details, and he couldn't have invented them. He didn't have enough imagination. They were long, complicated films. It took him two months to tell us the story of the first one. When we reached the end, we couldn't remember the beginning. And when we asked him to start all over. I thought I'd like to go to the cinema someday. My father and mother had never been, nor my brothers and sisters. They were too poor. The cinema was a luxury for city folks, like television. The master and the mistress had a television. Sometimes at night, when we were trying to fall asleep, we could hear those strange voices in Hussein Khan's living room and see the colored lights through the rush matting at the window. Kareem, always Kareem, bragged that once he'd sneaked up to one of the windows and had seen almost five minutes of a cricket game. What's cricket? I asked. Shut up, stupid, he answered. If you want my opinion, though, it was a big lie. It was true that Kareem did everything the master wanted and that he supervised us because otherwise he would have had nowhere to go and nothing to eat, but he would never have had the courage to peek into the master's windows. It was big trouble for anyone to go near the house. Suddenly I realized I had to get back to the work. My mind had wandered. Just in time, I managed to recapture a thread I was about to lose. 
Then the sunbeams were blocked, and the two swords of light stopped fighting. We all turned around to see the master standing in the doorway. His big body filled it. He was dressed for traveling with a long coat that almost reached his feet and boots covered with red dust. In his left hand, he held the sand, iron grip. The boy was thin and dark and not very tall. He looked about two years older than me. My first impression that he was handsome. Then I thought, no, he isn't really good looking, but he had such eyes. They were sweet and deep and they weren't afraid. He was staring at the threshold of the workroom with Hussein Khan's enormous hand gripping his arm and we were all looking at him. The 14 of us child slaves plus Kareem, all observing another slave. He was one of the many who had come and gone over the years. But we felt that somehow this new boy was different. He looked around at us one by one. He was sad, of course, like anyone who has been away from home for a long time, like anyone who is little more than a slave, like anyone who can't imagine what will become of him. But I'm telling you this, he wasn't afraid. Hussein Khan looked up at us and growled, what do you think you're looking at? Get back to work. We went bent to our looms, but then we quickly peeked over our shoulders. Hussein brought the new boy over to an empty loom in the row next to mine, pulled out a rusty shackle and locked it on the boy's right ankle. This will be your place. Here's where you work, he said. And if you work well, I know, the boy responded. Hussein took the usual slate, already covered with lines. This is your debt, he began. And every evening I, I know, said the new boy. All right then, said Hussein. All right, Mr. Know-it-all. Your old master told me that you're stubborn and proud. He also told me, however, that nobody knows how to work like you when you want to. We'll see, we'll see. Hussein headed toward the door. Once there, he stopped and pointed his fat finger at Kareem. And you, keep your eye on him. Kareem nodded uncertainly. The new boy sat at his loom and began to work. We watched him in silence, our mouths open. Nobody was as fast and skillful as he was. Nobody knew how to tighten the knots with such precision and delicacy. His fingers flew, even though the pattern Hussein had assigned him was one of the most difficult. One thing was for certain. He wasn't chained because he was a dumb school. No, no, it was for some other reason. What's your name? asked Kareem, trying to make his voice sound tough. Iqbal, he answered. Iqbal Masih. Chapter five. It was a special morning. When foreign customers arrived, Hussein Khan couldn't bully us too badly in their, presidents, in their presence. He had to convince them that we were treated well. These are my apprentices, he would say, distributing affectionate pats left and right. Here they earn an honest profession that will assure them a better future, one without hunger and poverty. They're like my own family. I don't really know if the foreigners believed him or not. Foreigners were funny that way. You don't know what to make of them. Usually they were elegantly dressed men with cold eyes, but every now and then a woman would visit, a lady whose legs and arms weren't covered. And she'd say, what lovely children. I'm not sure we were so lovely. That morning we had a bigger breakfast than usual, which that alone put us in a good mood. And we were allowed to laugh and chat while we waited to pass the filthy curtain outside the bathroom. The numbskulls had already finished. And for the sake of the foreigners, they wouldn't be chained to their looms that day. The rest of us were waiting in line, pushing and shoving. Be good children, be good, cried the mistress, but it didn't sound like her usual nasty warning. Even Hussein, who usually appeared halfway through the morning, pulling up his pants and sleepy eyed, was already awake and agitated. He was sweaty and talked nonstop. Kareem was terrified by the idea that something could could go wrong and that Hussein would blame it on him. The finished carpets were ready in the storage room and the ones in making were on display on the looms. There was almost a festive air to the place. 
I was waiting for my turn, little Maria hanging onto my skirt. And I was trying to avoid Ali's elbows and Salman's pinches. I felt a strange feeling inside of me, one like wind in my breast. I was sure that I could jump very high, soar, and finally reach the edge of that window frame. Certainly nobody could have imagined what was gonna happen. Nobody was paying much attention to Iqbal, who was standing beside his loom. Most of the children avoided him because they were envious. Also, he tended to keep to himself as though he was occupied with serious thoughts. I never got my turn at the bathroom that morning and I never reached the window that looked out onto the flowering almond. Hussein, nervous and excited, paced around the workshop. Suddenly he stopped and turned white. He was looking at something behind us. I remember his shocked eyes and his mouth slowly opening and revealing his tobacco blackened teeth. I'll never forget what I saw next. Iqbal was standing next to his loom. Behind him was his carpet, that marvelous carpet with this complicated design in a rich blue that had never been seen before. It was perfect. Iqbal had worked better and faster than anyone else could have. The foreigners would go crazy over a rug like that. Iqbal was pale too, but not as pale as Hussein Khan. He took the knife that we all used to cut the ends of the knots, raised it above his head, and seemed to look each of us in the eye. Then he calmly turned and cut the carpet from top to bottom, right through the middle. No, I thought, don't. In the silence that had fallen over the workshop, we heard a distinct rip of the sliced threads. Hussein Khan screamed like a stuck pig. The mistress screamed, Kareem screamed, because he always did everything they did. We saw them take off across the room, raising a dust cloud of dust and lint, tripping over each other, cursing and swearing as true believers should never do. Before they could grab him and take the knife away, Iqbal had cut twice more and the world's most beautiful blue carpet was in pieces, destroyed on the red earth of the floor. The silence seemed to last forever. Instinctively looking for protection, we had gathered in a corner of the workshop. Hussein Khan was standing in front of Iqbal, threatening Iqbal with his sheer size. His face was red and the swollen veins in his neck looked ready to burst. He was holding the knife he had taken from Iqbal and for a terrible moment, we all thought, he's gonna kill him. The mistress sobbed and collected the pieces of rug from the floor, wiping off the red dust as if a miracle might put them back together again. Kareem held his head in his hands. He was desperate, even though it wasn't his property. Hell child, hissed Hussein. Hell child, they said you were a rebel, a traitor. They said Hussein, don't trust him. He's a viper, a poisonous snake, an ingrate. But I, blind and stupid, I thought, oh, you'll pay for this, you'll pay. Into the tomb, cried the mistress. Throw him into the tomb and never let him out again. They grabbed him by the arms and dragged him into the courtyard. We followed, but stopped at the door like a group of frightened baby chicks. We saw Iqbal's knees scrape on the stones of the ground, his arm bang against the edge of the well. The master stopped at the rusty iron door and pulled it slowly open on a rasping hinges. We saw him disappear down the steps into the dark, jerking Iqbal after him. Then we heard the awful, terrifying sound that haunted our sleep. The grate of the tomb as it was raised and then bang as it fell closed. The sound echoed in the heavy heat of the courtyard. We couldn't breathe. The air was motionless. The dust lay still. Only the horse flies stirred, continuing to bite at our legs, but nobody even attempted to swat them away. Hussein Khan came back up from underground. We heard his slow, heavy footsteps. When he emerged into the sun, he squinted his eyes. He closed the door with one final push and approached us where we were still clinging together at the entrance to the workshop. To work, he growled. 
We returned to our looms. We took up our work. All together, the same movements, the same sound of the comb. Tumph, tumph, tumph. Hussein stood behind us in silence. We could feel his eyes look through us. Tumph, tumph, tumph. Ali, who worked on my right, mouthed the words. Why did he do it? I gestured quickly. I don't know. As he was being dragged over the stones of the courtyard, just a second before he disappeared, Iqbal had turned his head and looked at me. He wanted to say something. I wasn't sure I understood, but one thing seemed clear. Iqbal was as frightened as we were, but he'd done it all the same. Chapter seven. Iqbal was released from the tomb three days later. When we saw him walk across the courtyard on wobbly legs, blinded by the light, his arms covered in angry insect bites, we pitied him, but we were proud too. We would have liked to cheer and applaud, but Hussein's grim eyes warned us to keep quiet. The master gave Iqbal a day and a night to rest, and we held back our curiosity and respected his fitful sleep. We took turns watching over him and soothing his pain by sponging him with cool water. We could see that Iqbal would recover quickly, thanks to our nightly visits, the food, the water, and those oranges that Ali had stolen from the garden for him. Brother, said Salman one morning when Iqbal finally returned to work. You were really strong. Nobody has ever had the courage to do something like that to Hussein Khan. Do you realize how angry he is about the carpet? But you are also foolish. What have you gained by destroying the carpet? Three days in the tomb, that's all. You all took risks coming out at night to help me, Iqbal replied. If the master had discovered you, what would you have gotten out of it? What has that got to do with anything? Asked Salman. We did it for you. Well, said Iqbal, and I did it for you in a certain sense, as well as for me. What do you mean? I asked. It means this kind of life isn't right. We should return to our families. We shouldn't be chained to our looms and forced to work like slaves. I'd like to go home too, I said, but we can't. Why not? Because, because, burst in Salman, because the master's stronger than us, because it's always been like this, because nobody cares about us. We'll find somebody to help us out there. There must be someone. Out there, what's going on in your head? I don't know, said Iqbal. You got too much heat down in the tomb, brother. Someone shook his head. Everybody's too scared here. That's not true, Iqbal laughed. You're not afraid anymore. Neither are Fatima and little Ali. So this was an excerpt from the book and I really wanted to share it with everybody because it kind of acts as, um, so a lot of times when we are listening to something, it takes all of us inside that book. And I'd like to believe that all of us are rethinking what we had read about the book and we are in a better place to talk about child slavery, the character of Iqbal, what does having these characters mean and what is the true story of Iqbal himself so um, I know that all of you don't have um, many more uh, thoughts on this right now but I'm hoping that as we progress further into the conversation you'd like to um, you know have your thoughts in it so I'll quickly give my thoughts and I'm going to move to my colleagues in Lahore and get ask them to have their thoughts and then I will come to you per one and ask if anyone would like to give their thoughts so basically, this book, Iqbal, is based on the true story of an amazing boy. His name was Iqbal Masi. As the character says, he was a carpet weaver, but he had something much more than slavery uh, in his life, in his reality. And that was the thought and the idea that he was much bigger than this. 
that he was much better than this, that he was free, even though he was enslaved, but he was meant to be free. He was meant to make his own choices, but those choices were taken away from him. He was forced into weaving carpets, but he was meant to be free to weave carpets. He was meant to be an individual with choices. He was supposed to be a child who was supposed to enjoy his childhood. He was supposed to laugh and play and run around the fields, feeling the freedom in the wind, in the very air that he breathed, because that is what he knew every human being deserved. And with these thoughts and with these ideas, he knew that what he wanted to do was risky. It was dangerous and it was hard, but he was still willing to do it because he knew to not do anything was again enslaving himself further and he wanted to be free. So um, he did all that he could and then some more. He created awareness for child slavery, for child labor, for enforced slavery, for corruption within the system that reads this kind of culture in countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, where children are sold as commodities, where families are put into debt, which they can never get out of because it feeds the debt owner. And uh, a society which is built on exploitation, exploitation of the weak. And it is these issues that we must change. It is these issues that we must raise. And it is these issues that we must acknowledge as part of our realities. And in this book, there is something which is much more than a story. It is our realities, a glimpse into our underbelly, a glimpse into our ugliness, into our society's shortfallings that we refuse to accept, that we refuse to acknowledge because it is too much and it's uncomfortable and we have learned to hide from uncomfortable. We have learned over time to not question the uncomfortable. It is, we have been taught systematically to turn the other way when things are not as they should be. Very few of us actually question our realities. Actually, we don't even look around us with the honest identity of independence and freedom. We see children on the street as pests who are asking for arms. We don't see them as children who don't know any better, who are forced into these circumstances because they don't have a choice. Because as the story of Iqbal tells us, if there was a choice, every child would choose childhood. And on that note, I'm gonna to move to, uh, to my friends in Lahore and ask them to tell me about what they think about the book and also share some testimonies from our friends in Pakistan who have read the book and shared their thoughts on it. So Lahore, over to you. Hi everyone, hello, I'm back. So uh, uh, Alia, you have put a very uh, great review of the book and you've put all the thoughts that I had in my mind about this book. So uh, before I share testimonies from our friends in Pakistan, I have a question for our uh, participants in Parwan. So um, my question is that this book is written from another person, Fatima's perspective, the girl who was already working for Hussain Khan. And she saw um, basically Iqbal's character is introduced when he enters uh, the workplace and he uh, becomes a part of uh, that bonded labor bonded slavery in Hussein Khan's uh, carpet weaving place. So my question is that why uh, do you think the author wrote the book from Fatima's point of view? You could have also written it from Iqbal's point of view, but why do you think it's, um, it's more important or why do you think that um, the writer chose to write the story in Fatima's point of view, in her perspective? Uh, 
Uh, well, uh, so after uh, they get free of Hussain Khan's uh, place uh, that they were working, uh, so Fatima, uh, Maria, and Iqbal uh, stay in the quarter of uh, Ishan Khan. So Ishan Khan is the, you know, he is one of the kind of employees of volunteers, we can say, that he was working for uh, bonded child, child labor in uh, Pakistan. So he was working for that uh, organization that freed uh, the kids who were slaves. So uh, after that, uh, it's at Ball's dreams that he wants to free other children as well. They were holding children under Hussain Khan's hand, but uh, like Akbal wanted to do more than that. Uh, though Isham Khan wanted him to go back to his family, but he said that he wants to do more than this. And so he went on freeing other kids uh, in, in the you know in other places of Lahore. Uh, and then finally, uh, when like when he was back home on an Easter day, it, it is a festival in uh, Pakistan. So he was he was actually tired of you know meeting a lot of people after he came back after his activities were revealed on the TV shows and newspapers, and so uh, he he was tired of getting so much respected by people and he wanted to do some outdoor activities and he was bicycling. So when he was doing that, uh, the car, the black car, uh, just showed up in, in their village and it was, it, it turned the lane that uh, Akbal was riding uh, his bicycle and, you know, some flashes showed up and like five shots, uh, Akbal was shot five times. I mean, he, he was shot five bullets and he was dead under the rain. Uh, so then Maria writes a letter to uh, Fatima that she has to, uh, you know, she has to convey this message, this story to other people. And so that's Fatima's point of view that uh, I think she travels to another country and she finds out that writer that can write about their story. So uh, that's the reason why Iqbal could not, could not uh, this, this book was not written from Iqbal's pers uh, perspective because he was, he was dead uh, when he was 13. So one thing more I'd like to share about uh, one more character is Maria. So uh, what I like is that when she gets scared, she gets behind uh, Fatima and she, she covers herself. And so uh, there are three uh, great stories uh, I like about Maria. One was that uh, when Fatima talks about Kai, that do you know what a Kai is like? And Maria says, no, I don't know how that, how that looks like. But then she imagines a lot. One day after uh, Hassan Khan comes up, uh, comes from, he comes back from a trip and sees everybody's work, and he, he his eyes gets wide and when, when he sees Maria's work because she has not uh, completed her rug, but instead she has drawn something else on her rug, and there is a kai. So Hussain Khan gets really angry, and he wants to uh, put Maria in the tomb too, but. Other kids, they, they get up and say that, well, if you're putting Maria, then put me put me in the tomb too. And everybody does like that. So Hussain Khan uh, can do something because if he does something, like if, if he puts everybody in the tomb, nobody can work and he cannot earn money. So the next thing about Maria is that uh, with, with it, there is a paper that Iqbal brings after his first escape from the Hussain Khan's house. And then when he, when he comes back, he has a paper uh, uh, which has written some things that, uh, you know, the child, child uh, the bonded child labor in Pakistan can help them. And so nobody can read that. They pass it to everybody, like 13 kids, they do not understand what it is. And from back, they hear a sound of Maria, the, the very little one. And she says that I can read, uh, I can read. And everybody is surprised and astonished that uh, this, you know, how can Maria read? And then she tells on a story. But I really like that uh, after a lot of time, Maria was given that attention of 13 kids that he didn't ever receive. So it, it was great. Uh, there are many more things to tell. Uh, if, if I remember, I'll tell more. Because one thing more that I could not, like, I, I should have read this book, like, uh, part to part, like, how uh, yes. Like I should have divided in parts and then I should have read for like one hour and then the next hour and the next hour. But I read it four hours consecutively. That's why I don't remember a lot. Because it, it, it uh, you know, it expected me to read the next paper, as, the next page as well. When I read, when I finished the, that page, 
and like I, I was dragged into the book that I wanted to read more. And so when I finished, I was like, oh, it's finished. So I have a lot to say, but if I remember, uh, I'll say it again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And I I second you because when I was reading this book, I also finished it in like two to three hours. It, it was so much gripping and I couldn't put it down. And I was like, I have to finish this book in this. And uh, I remember when uh, I had already finished one book and then I started reading Iqbal, I thought, oh, it's such a small book. It's just 100 page, pages. I'll be able to read it in one, one hour. But I think the story was so amazing and I have heard about Iqbal already since we, when I was growing up, his struggle and his story has been coming up in the media, in newspapers, and now people actually celebrate Iqbal's life very much. But, uh, and his story uh, is actually said, uh, he was, uh, I think it's his story became popular in the late 1990s. But uh, since then he has become an icon for wanted labor for, child, for children in slavery. But I think, uh, when I was reading this book, uh, even though it's a small story, it's uh, a very quick read, there were some parts where I had to put, put the book down and take a big uh, sigh or a breath. Because uh, especially the part when Iqbal destroys his carpet and I was like, oh my God, what he has done. And I was feeling exactly the same what the other children were feeling. But then I was like, hey, um, even though I'm not, um, Thank God that I'm not, uh, I haven't been in those conditions. I don't know what those kids go through, but the story was written in such a feeling, empathy for those kids. And instead of getting, you know, empowered by Iqbal's move, I was, I uh, got scared that what will Hussein Khan do, do to him? And uh, I think that's the power of good books, that they make you feel the same way the characters are feeling. And I'm so glad that you um, um, got attached to so many characters. You discussed the character of Fatima, you discussed the character of Maria. And the question that I asked you guys that why do you think it was written for, from Fatima's point of view? One that you raised that, um, that Iqbal had died and they had to show that how some other person was, and Maria asked her uh, to write a story about uh, Iqbal. But of course, this whole, um, the writer has fictionalized it as well. Uh, I think in my point of view, I think um, I could be wrong as well, or my colleagues can correct me. I think uh, the writer chose to write this book from Fatima's point of view because he wanted to show that um, even though Fatima was not in the condition that she could think better for herself. She was already uh, into child slavery when she was very small and she couldn't know that there is a future other than this for her. But when Iqbal enters her life, she sees a light. She gets hopeful. So I think that's why the writer chose to write this book from Fatima's point of view so that, so that he could show that there is someone else who is already stranded in this situation and now they are getting some hope to get out of it. So I think even the story is very, you know, it's very bleak, it shows a very harsh reality of our society, it's still, um, Leaves, that, leaves us at a hopeful note. We're still hopeful that there is, um, we're not, I'm not trying to say that um, there, there's going to be someone who will come and save these children. I think it, it is also making us feel that we have also go out and do our part. So uh, I think these are my thoughts. Uh, anyone from uh, Parwan who would like to add on to this? Mr. Ramat, I'm ready to say something about uh, Iqbal Nawal. Sure, Umar, please go ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, in the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful, at the first, assalamu alaikum. I hope everybody be healthy and also be glad. Uh, welcome to this session. Today's session is about um, Iqbal Nawal. Mm, Iqbal novel is about about the hidden reality of innocent children uh, sold to wealthy sweet shop owner by their parent and in order to pay off family debts and Iqbal and uh, actual child's life uh, was only four years old 
when his father sold him to a carpet fever for um, I think sixteen dollar in the nineteen eighty. This novel is told through the eyes of a young female slave Fatima who worked with uh, Iqbal at a um, carpet the factory, also known as a sweet shop. Uh, she reveals uh, reveals and also the, uh, the terrible reality of being a slave in Pakistan. Working long hour, um, crammed into a dark uh, and also a humid room with no fresh air and uh, other young child slept. Uh, this child, uh, ch children uh, are either parent, uh, these children may be uh, orphans or have been sold by their parents to wealthy and businessmen to pay off family debts. Uh, these children do not uh, attend a school and state they are thrust into the uh, into the life of an adult and um, working 15 hours a day in appealing um, condition. It's all about uh, Apple and Noel. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughts. And, and they were amazing. I'm so glad that you actually uh, read the book and you understood the different characters, the different, um, you know, uh, sensitivities that were situated within the novel. So that's always, always great to hear. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask Hurmat to share testimonies from Pakistan because we are slightly short of time. And uh, uh, we will first have uh, take a listen to what our friends in Pakistan had to say about the book. And then we will come back for our closing remarks. And uh, that's how we will proceed further. So, Hurmat, if you could just play the testimonies. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Please let me know if you can see it. Um, you can see it, right? Oh. Hello, everyone. My name is Sara, and I am from Lahore, Pakistan. Today I am here to tell you about the review of the book Iqbal. Iqbal is a historical based, uh, historical fiction based uh, loosely on the life of a Pakistani boy. It deals with the very real problem of child labor by expressing the stories of several children uh, working in horrific conditions and unlike most of the children how they manage to escape and tell their stories. Uh, Iqbal, is a, uh, Iqbal is about a group of children who were forced to engage in slave labor, uh, weaving carpets in Lahore, Pakistan. The novel tells us about uh, the novel tells us about uh, the new child who convinces other child that uh, they are responsible for their own escape or remain slaves forever. The second book, Ninety Nine Nights in Assalamu alaikum, I am Aniba and I am here to share the review of the book Iqbal. Iqbal is basically a novel on the, on the life of Iqbal, a child who at the age of 10 bring the change in the lives of hundreds of child children living in Lahore facing child labor. He set them free from their masters and this book gave us the moral that to bring a change a single person is enough if you are determined and if you are courageous you can bring a change in your society we can't say that the issues of pakistan or issues of pakistan are not our issues we are living in pakistan and this is our responsibility to solve all those issues that pakistan is facing we should have to take the step on our place and try to change our society change, uh, and try to solve all the issues of Pakistan. So yeah, I'm really thankful to Book Club Across the Borders to, for providing me such a great and incredible book. Thank you. So these were the videos from our students from Pakistan who read this book, Iqbal, and shared their views. Um, Alia, over to you. Thank you. So now let's talk about the concept of child labor as it exists in our society. What I want to understand is 
how does it exist in Afghanistan? How have you people experienced child labor? And what do you know about it in your country? So anybody who could tell me about the existence of child labor and bonded slavery in Afghanistan. <laughs> Actually, I think we are with myself, uh, child labor in Afghanistan, something like they just uh, bring them somewhere that uh, they are, they work, they force uh, them to work, uh, like we can say the factories, car factories and other factories that they work. And uh, also, yeah, I have one of my classmates that uh, uh, I can mention her name, her name is Maryam. Actually, uh, she had experienced uh, such a thing. So um, today I was reading uh, the notes that I have uh, talked before. So and she asked me that what are you reading? And I just um, talked about a ball who was um, a slaver. Then she her eyes just full of uh, uh, tears and just he told me that I also have such experience before. Like um, she lived in Hira. Uh, then uh, due to some problems, uh, her dad just uh, told them to work in uh, the factory, carpet factory. Uh, then uh, when she just started the uh, working over there, uh, uh, her dad didn't let her to come home again. It, it was like a, a whole of the day, whole of the night, she could, um, she must uh, work over there. It was like uh, she cannot see uh, that light or the sun uh, uh, out of there. And it was like um, uh, he was, she was invisible to the whole of the work. Like she just had to work over there and, uh, for someone who didn't know him. And uh, I, I just thought, like, um, when she just tell me her story, it was like, I'm walking through her story. Like, uh, I can experience that, uh, how it feels to not see the world, not see the, the sunshine again, and just work in somewhere that we don't know how it's, uh, it's going. And uh, actually, from uh, the other countries, uh, the Pakistan and Afghanistan, and also Africa, as one of the countries uh, which is um, where children labor is a lot, uh, it happened a lot over there. And around the uh, eight um, uh, eight thousand fifty five um, children uh, across the country, uh, across the Afghanistan, just um, uh, uh, they just uh, oh, you can see. Transfer, no, yes, a smuggle uh, from other country. Sorry, I'm just, I don't know why I'm sometimes missing the words. Um, because, uh, you know, I was good before morning, but I just hear uh, her, um, her terrified story just feel like, um, how is our country like most of the time you're not thinking about like uh how is our country like you're just deeply in our own life like just sleeping breathing and going to school and uh, having fun with friends but we don't know how someone's uh, feeling and how she experienced something but it's good to keep talking with people with uh, even with those we don't know him or her and i didn't know mariam's life because she's a uh, a new student in our, uh, our class, but when I just start talking with her, it was like I'm entering a, I'm entering a new world with uh, her, like uh, being some slavery and working somewhere that you don't know anyone and your dad would not let you to come home and uh, you cannot see the sunshine again. And this is all I had to tell you. Thank you so much for that. And I'm so happy to hear that they that you have a colleague, a friend, a schoolmate who was uh, put into child labor and is out of those evil cl uh, cl clutches now. And uh, um, it's children like these who have so much of baggage that they bring with them because life has been so tough for them who need us the most. They need our support, they need our encouragement and above everything else they need our acceptance for who they are because it is by accepting our differences and the different life experiences that we've had that we are able to create a more tolerant society and that is one of the most important things to learn about um, how to create more tolerant more equitable societies 
I was I was earlier speaking to um, students in Nangarhar, and we were discussing another book. But we were discussing and we were talking about equality and uh, and the feminine and the masculine, and we were talking about creating societies where um, it doesn't matter what your gender is. Your gender does not equate your success or failure in life. Exactly in the same ways, I want all of us to acknowledge, understand, and endorse that um, where we started from in life is not important as much as where we end up in life is. So that means that um, some of us might have had a more difficult road to walk on to reach the destination that we find ourselves at. But that doesn't mean that our journey, just because it was different from everyone else's, is not worth sharing. And it is only by opening ourselves and becoming more, uh, you know, more tolerant of receiving differences in opinions, will we be able to create structures and societies which deal more with human beings and their self and their worth and their use than with anything else. And that is one of the most important things that we learn from the story of Iqbal. Like I said in the beginning, um, Iqbal was born into a household. He was four years old when he was sold into slavery. And he died while he was a teenager. So he barely had any life to live. And that life was pretty much stolen from him even before he was born. And that was just a product of his birth. He didn't choose to be there. He was born in this. And even though he was born into such difficult circumstances, he never took it for granted that this is how it will be forever. He knew that there was a different world. He knew that he needed to expect better. He knew that he had to fight to get what was actually rightfully his which was his freedom, his childhood. That's all he wanted. He wanted a childhood for himself. He wanted a childhood for all the people that were working in such bonded labors throughout his life. He wanted to be a voice because he understood that there was something amiss. And you know, there is something extremely charming in this book written in Fatima's voice. And I'll explain to you why I think so. You know, throughout the book, we are made to believe that Fatima is mute and she can't talk and she's gone through some trauma and she doesn't know. It is only when Iqbal is able to explain to everybody that we can change things, is Fatima able to acknowledge that she had a life before she was here. And in that life, she used to talk, she used to write, and she, was, she used to read. And it is these three things that we learn about Fatima that makes us understand that because she wasn't talking, she was absorbing more, she was listening more because she wasn't talking. And because she wasn't talking and she was listening more, she had more to tell. And that is why when we read the book in Fatima's story, we read about kids, which we might not have read about had it been written by somebody who was talking throughout. So just the fact that she didn't have a voice while she was inside didn't mean that she did not have a voice. She chose not to have a voice then. But when the time was right and she could benefit from her voice being heard, she made sure that millions of people would hear her voice when they read her book. So there is some kind of poetic justice in this book being written in Fatima's voice because we don't hear her voice throughout the book. Even though there are circumstances when you would 
expect to hear her shout or expect to hear her cry out in pain. I mean, especially the point when she is being rushed into, uh, being thrown into the dungeon. We all expect that she's such a delicate, vulnerable child. She's going to break down. She's going to say something. And we don't hear anything from her even then. But when something happens to Iqbal, we hear her sound. And we hear it so powerfully that it resonates with all of us. And each and every one, everyone who reads this book will understand not just Iqbal's message, but Fatima's story as well. So that is why I think there is something extremely solid in this book being written in Fatima's narrative. And uh, um, yeah, so I feel like this is one book that is a very thin read, but is a very powerful read. So this is one of those books that I feel we should read again and again so that we keep reminding ourselves of what exists around us as a norm every day, because this is our reality. Kids like Iqbal, Fatima, Maria, our children around us that we see every day, but we are just tired of acknowledging. So I think we need to get out of our own slumber and actually wake up and fight for what is right. And I'd like to believe that when we sit down here and talk about these really uh, pertinent issues to our societies and what is plaguing our culture, will we be able to not just bring those things that are the underbelly into the forefront, but we will also be able to fight um, you know, inequalities and injustices that exist in our systems around us by accepting them, by acknowledging them, and by giving our voice to causes which are right. So that is one of the most important things to have in our lives. And on that note, I'm going to sign off because we are out of time. It was a pleasure sitting here and discussing this book with you, like always. Um, I really believe that we are doing something really important. We're building a community of like-minded people. We're building a community where we are questioning each and everything that we were told to be taken as it is with the grain of salt and never to question. So I think we are in the right place and I hope and pray that we continue to keep doing so. So on that note, I wish each and every one of you a very, very happy Ramzan. I hope and pray that God shines his mercy and his blessings on each and every one of us and our lives turn better and better as we progress forward. So on that note, I'm going to say khudafiz from each and everyone here in, in Pakistan and I would love to hear your goodbyes before we sign off. Uh, have a very nice time Um, sorry, Alina, can you repeat? What did you just say? Uh, okay, I just told you that uh, have a very nice time and goodbye. And uh, it was very nice to um, have you once again in our session. And uh, we hope that uh, the uh, next sessions, uh, uh, all of us uh, uh, face to each other with a very happy and content faces and to discuss more and also to read more books. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Oh. Uh, one more thing to say about the book is that uh, I love uh, at all start that we never forget something. Like uh, Akma is oppressed a lot that she forgets everything. Like she doesn't remember her mother, father, because the, the image is fade away from her memory. So uh, like what this is that he has all the things, all his memories remember in his mind that he never forgets. And he confesses that every night before she, he goes to sleep, he has those thoughts you know, remember again uh, that she that he never wants to forget every, every single day. So what I get from this is that uh, giving up on a dream is never good to do. So because uh, dreams are, you know, we, we dream because we have to work on that. We, we have to fulfill our dreams. And so uh, this really, is, this is it's, it's inspiring uh, sentences from Iqbal that I will uh, keep in mind always. And uh, to never fade away the memories, the dreams that I have to.
good for the individual. Thank you so much. The book was really nice. I would like to thank uh, everybody uh, for sharing their thoughts and for, for giving this opportunity for us to read the book. Thank you so much. See you next session, inshallah. Thank you so much. That's for the half from our end. See you next time for the half